Rhonda and I have spent the week apart. I went to Lone Rock. She stayed here and worked and rearranged the motorhome so I don't know where anything's at, okay? Uh, it's, you would think that you couldn't do that in such a small space, but she managed to do that. And then I got here on Thursday, and she left on Friday. Bright and early Friday morning, she got on an airplane, went down to San Jose, and then came back on, on Saturday, went to a play. I went to a basketball game on Friday. It was not a very good basketball game. I watched Willamina's girls get crushed. Um, and then I watched the boys for the first half of their game, and they won. And they're still undefeated, by the way. They're 7-0. and Yes. If you haven't been to one of the boys' game here for Willamina, basketball game, you need to go. They are really fun to watch. They, they, are, they are fun to watch. They probably don't want to sit by me when you go, because I might say something to one of the guys wearing a striped shirt, and somebody yell at me a little bit. So you might want to sit someplace else, but... Um, yeah. We're going to talk about something that's really, really important this morning. We're going to talk about, we're really going to talk about being real. Being, being who you're supposed to be. And making sure that and doing our best to line that up with what God has told us to do. That's, that's really, in a nutshell, what we're going to talk about. The, the t title in the 10th chapter is See Them Fall. I, I just, uh, or is uh, Standing Tall, I, I entitled it See Them Fall. Um, you know, there's an old saying, the, heart, the, taller, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Well, there's so much truth in that, in this story in Samuel that we're going to look at. There's really two stories. We're going to look at the, the story of Samuel and, and the story of Saul. And in and, and both of them, they are people who become immensely important in the nation of Israel. And both of them have severe failings. Or as we said in Sunday school class, they sin. And because of that, there, there's, there are issues. The story begins with, with Hannah, who wants to have a baby. And Hannah wants to have a baby because her husband has two wives. And the other wife's fertile myrtle. I mean, she's, got, she's having babies. It's no problem. Hannah can't get pregnant. And so she prays that she will get pregnant, and the priest finally prays for her to have a baby, and she does have a baby. She names him Samuel, which means God heard me. And she, but she had made a promise to God. And so Amanda, think about this. In two years, when you're done weaning your baby, you take your baby to the temple, and you say, here God, this is your baby. And she would see Samuel then once a year. That would tear you up, wouldn't it? Oh my goodness, that would just tear you up. But, that's what, but she had made a promise. She had made a promise to God, and she did the thing that is so important. She kept her word. She did what she had said she would do, so she takes the baby to God. And Samuel is raised by the priest. And God and Samuel develop this very close relationship. But brothers and sisters, it's no different than the relationship that we can have with God. You know, we read the stories in the Bible and sometimes we think, oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? It's reality. If, if, if the Bible is true, which I firmly believe that it is true, and I hope you do too, that if the Bible is true, then those stories in the Bible should not, I always believe and have believed this, the stories in the Bible should not be the abnormal. They should be the normal. God's people should be able to have those relationships that, that we read about. 
When I read about Paul in the New Testament, and everybody says, oh, what a, Paul was such an anomaly. No, he wasn't. Paul was exactly what God wants from us. He wants us to be, be all out for him. And so he, he calls that. And Samuel was that young man. But there was a problem. There was a problem in the... There was a problem with the priest. And which leads to really point two of the story that we're doing today. And that is this issue of distorting God's purpose. God didn't send his son to die for us so that we can just go on and do whatever we want to and then, then, and then just, oh God, forgive me. And then go out and live like hell the next week and then come to church on Sunday and say, oh God, forgive me. And then go out and live like hell again for another week and then come back and say, oh God, forgive me. I'm not saying that we don't have that ability to ask for God's forgiveness. That's not what I'm saying. But it, doesn't, he, it isn't that he wants us to do the same thing over and over and over again. Growing up, I, I learned very quickly that, well, I didn't learn it. because it, I, did, I didn't learn it, I, but I, I understood the consequences of not doing what mom and dad told me to do. I would not say that I learned those, but I, I understood the consequences. When I didn't do what mom and dad told me to do, there were consequences. Usually had to do with a switch or a belt. Or some ugly chore that I did not want to do. You know, like go clean the chicken coop out. No, I don't want to. Or go pull all the tansy ragwort out of the field. No, I didn't want to. But there was consequences for not doing what I had been asked to do. And with us, same thing applies when it comes to God. There are consequences for it. And God had asked the children of Israel and asked their leaders to do certain things. And because they didn't do them, there were consequences. The priest Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they abused the sacrificial system that God had set in place. They, they committed sexually immoral acts and because of that there were consequences they wouldn't change the consequences didn't come oh they did this and boom god struck them with fire the consequences was that they had done these things and god had told them that they needed to stop and they didn't stop and because of that they all died god found a way to replace them because they were they were being phony. They were not doing what God had told them to do. They were, they, were, they were what Jesus called the Pharisees in the New Testament. He said they were whitewashed tombs. You look really nice on the outside, but inside you're rotten. Inside you just stink. It's kind of like the, the sandwich that you open up. You know, the bread looks real good. And you open it up and the lettuce is a little slimy. And the meat's got some mold on it. It looks really good on the outside, but on the inside, it's not what it's supposed to be. Sometimes that happens to us. And, and God doesn't like that. He doesn't like that at all. He asked for us to be the same. Many years ago, uh, preaching at a church in, in Salinas, California, uh, one of the best compliments I ever heard about the people of the, that were going to church there is somebody said, well, why, they asked, why do they go to church? This was at a Weight Watchers deal. And they said, why do you go to church there? And Because this person hadn't been going to church. And her comment was this. This, you see the same thing on Sunday morning that you see on Wednesday night here at this class. Hello. That's what, 
That's what God wants from us. That's why he doesn't want us to be phony. He wants what, what people see on Sunday to be the same thing they see on Monday. And that's the same thing they're going to see on Tuesday and every day of the week. When they, when they see us, they're going to see the same thing. We're going to act the same way. We're going to talk the same way. We're going to do the same things. We're, we're going to be nice to each other. We're going to pick on little kids and make them smile when they don't want to. We're going to be the same every day of the week. That way we're not seen as being phony or seen as being a hypocrite. The other thing that was the problem for the children of Israel was this problem that we have in the world today. It usually shows up most when we're teenagers. And I use this example, you know, I don't want to look like everybody else. I, don't, I, I just want to be different. So I'm going to get the same nose ring that everybody else is wearing. So I can be different. I'm going to wear the same clothes. With, I'm going to go pay $65 for a pair of jeans that's got holes already put in it. So I can be different. You know, I... I'm going to, and I'm not saying I'm against tattoos. That's not what I'm saying when I say this. I'm going to get a tattoo, you know, and it's, it's going to be just on, the, on my back, and I'm going to get a tattoo so I can be different. I'll pay for that. <laughs> and in reality, what we're doing is not being different. We're conforming to what everybody else is already doing. If you remember the late 80s and early 90s and women's hair, oh my goodness gracious, you know, there was more air, hairspray used in the 80s and 90s. Uh, you want to know what's wrong with the ozone layer in America. <laughs> it was the hairstyle of the 80s and 90s, come on. I'm, and I had, I had three daughters, teenage daughters. Goodness gracious, we had more hair. You could have made rugs out of the hair we had around our house. But again, it was it's conformity. We, we have this great desire to look like everybody else. And, and that conformity can, can affect our Christianity where we want to look and be like everybody else in the world. And God doesn't ask us to be like everybody else. He asks us to be different. He asks us to be the abnormal. He asks us to live in a way that that the world can't always understand and do not do the things that everybody else in the world does. See, that's what he asks of us. And it's important that we strive not to be people of conformity. If you look in your Bible at 1 Samuel 8, 6 and 1 Samuel 8, 20, you will start to see the problems that come with this conformity. And, and then... And then what is even worse, the children of Israel said, you know, everybody else around us has a king. We want to be like everybody else. We want a king. And you would have thought that after Samuel told them what the king was going to demand of them, that they would have said, ah, on second thought, we don't want a king. You know, we don't want to be paying that much in taxes. We don't want to be doing that. I said in Sunday school class this morning that you would think that people in Oregon would start to vote differently, uh, that people in America would start to vote differently, uh, that they would be tired of the distortion that goes on there. And the... And the taxes that are paid. Uh, by the way, I did see, I did get some statistics. I just want to throw this out at you. California is a beautiful state. It, it really is. It is an absolutely phenomenal state. Weather in central California it, down on the coast, you can play golf every day of the year. I mean, there's nothing, uh, Pebble Beach and Monterey, that is just gorgeous. But for some reason, a million people left California last year. A million people. 
left California to go to Texas where they got bugs bigger than who knows what, and, and to, to Florida where the mosquitoes will pick you away and tear, carry you off. They decided to go there. Why? Less taxes, and it's cheaper to live there. It's that simple. And the people are fleeing. They're fleeing what may be one of the prettiest states of the 50 that we have. But because, because of conformity, conformity causes a lot of problems for everybody. We want to look like everybody else. We want to act like everybody else. We want to have what everybody else has. And what they have is nothing but problems. And we need to strive to be authentic. We need to strive to be unique. We need to strive to be different because in being different we will look more like the one that we say that we are following. And that's Jesus Christ. And then the last and final thing, this, the last distortion that they talked about in, in, in the, the chapter that you just read was the, this distortion of misrepresentation. Misrepresenting what they want. God allowed the people to have a king. His permissive will, it wasn't what God wanted, but he allowed them to have a king. And they anoint, they anoint Samuel anoints Saul as the king. And if you read in there, it said that Saul was a head taller than everybody else in the country. How many of you remember when uh, the fellow by the name of Perot ran for president? You know, when they, whenever they had a debate, you know what they did for Mr. Perot? Because he was short. They had a booster stool for him so he could stand on it so he wouldn't look so short compared to everybody else so that he could conform. So that he, they misrepresented his height and his stature to all of America on TV so that we would think that he was the same height as the other people because most of the rest of the people on the stage were 6'2 or 6'3. He is about 5'7". Sometimes we need to be careful that we are not misrepresenting who we are. Saul does something that, that each one of us has fallen to, but for him it carries some huge consequences. And for us, when we disobey God, it carries huge consequences too. And I really appreciated what, what Jed said this morning in communion. You know, sin, we can't always see what it does. When you have the flu, we all know it. And everybody around you knows it. But sometimes when you have a sin that is down there in our heart, nobody can see it. And it's causing all sorts of problems. And Saul, Saul got himself and thought he was as important and as able to do things that Samuel the priest could do. First he disobeys God. Well, no, first he, first he offered a sacrifice that he shouldn't have offered because that's not his place. As king, he, that was not his place to do that. That was Samuel's place to do that, to offer the sacrifice to God. And then number two, he disobeyed what God told him to do. God told him, I want you to go against the Amalekites and I want you to wipe them out. Wipe them out. I don't want any of them to live. I want everything in their country destroyed. I want you to kill all the people. I want you to kill all the animals. I want you to kill it all. Take, I want them gone. Saul misrepresents to Samuel what he did. When he went, he didn't kill the king. And he didn't destroy all the cattle and the sheep. He kept some of it. He kept, he kept it for himself. And yet, when he got caught, he says, well, you know, I just, 
I saved the best stuff to offer God a sacrifice. He missed the point. The sacrifice should have already been offered. And just as a side story, just as an aside story, in the story of Esther, Haman is a descendant of who? Go on, go ahead. Amalekites. He is a descendant of the Amalekites. He wants to wipe out all the Israelite people and have them all killed. He is a descendant of those who are supposed to have already been gone. Just a little side story there. You see, when we don't do what God asks us to do, there are consequences for that. And, and some of those consequences could be very harsh, and, but there are consequences. Quite frankly, if we don't do what God has asked us to do in the accepting of his son, Jesus Christ, there is a huge and serious consequence. It's called hell. You know, it's almost got to the point in church anymore that we're not supposed to talk about hell and sin and all those things. But the truth of the matter is, if we do not accept Jesus Christ for who he is and what he has done for us, the consequences, we get to spend eternity in hell. If we do accept who he is, seek out God's forgiveness and strive to live in a life that... that aligns as much as we can with what God wants us to do, there's a great consequence to that too. It's called heaven. It don't take me long to figure out which one I want. So, here's what, here's what we need to understand and we need to know, and I, I want you to try to uh, take with you today when you leave. we have the responsibility of being representatives of God here on earth. We are the ones that have been given this great and wonderful task of sharing the good news about who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us. We become God's representative. We become his kids and we are asked to do that. We need to do our best to be like Samuel and not be like Saul. I, I know there's a, there's a little rhyme that used to go, and I can't, re I can't remember what it is, but don't be this, be this, don't be, you know, I can't remember what it is now. We need to be like Samuel. We need to strive to have that close relationship with God. We should not be surprised when God talks to us. And if we spend time in his word and, and we spend time in prayer, God will talk to us. Uh, I like the Seventh-day Adventist sign uh, as you're going to Grand Round, uh, uh, past the casino there. It uh, it's a great, great sign this, that they've got up there, and they change it regularly. I mean, it's like every, every couple of days it goes away, so if you miss it, you're going to get another one. But it, it says, in all the noise of the world today, God still hears prayer. I like that. And all of the mess that's going on around us, and all the goofiness that's going on around us, and all of the, all of the noise that we hear and all that stuff, but God still hears hears our prayer. I want to encourage you, and when I say this, I'm saying this to myself, I want to encourage you to spend more time in God's word and to spend more time in prayer so that we can look and be more like Samuel and not be like Saul. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, you... You bless us and you take care of us in ways that we uh, don't understand. You care for us and love us when we are not always very lovely and not un don't understand that either. But we're thankful for it and we're grateful for it. And so God, I, I come this morning asking that you would, that you would forgive us that 
we would realize our need more and more for you each day. And Lord, that when we leave here and we go out into our community, that we would be a reflection of you. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. In the morning when I rise, in the morning.